All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to our next edition of Mission Lives Innovative Church Conversations. Uh, we're excited here to have uh, Dr. Jimmy Durrell. Uh, I say Doral. I'm sorry. I say Doral. Doral. Okay. Matter, but I do. All right. Um, and uh, you are with Mission Waco, Mission World. That's one organization. Church Under the Bridge, and you also teach at uh, Truett Seminary at Baylor University. Is that right? That's right. All right. And technically, I'm now retired from Mission Waco after 28 years. Uh, I retired in April. I'm still president emeritus, so I'm around and doing things, but I'm not officially having to run everything now. Well, that's nice. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's very nice. Especially when COVID hit. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, Roy Rhodes is going to help me uh, with this interview. Roy is Mission Life's Director of Residencies and Stream Equipping, and he's the one that connected us up with you, uh, Jimmy, and so he'll be jumping in here in a minute. Uh, for everybody that's on here, Roy and I are going to ask some questions, but I want to invite you guys to be thinking about questions, whatever comes to mind. Down at the bottom, there's a chat function. Just hit that. Uh, type your question or your comment in the chat uh, window, and later on we'll call on you to unmute yourself uh, and ask your question. So with that, let's kick this off, and let me just ask Jimmy if you would briefly share uh, about your spiritual history, your journey, um, and somehow as you do that, would you weave in there uh, what exactly does it mean that you call yourself a recovering Baptist? <laughs> Okay, I can do that. Well, that, that actually is the first part of the story. I, I grew up in Conroe near Houston. It was a little town back then. Now it's part of Houston with a lake, and it wasn't back then. And I was your goody two-shoes kid. I didn't ring, didn't cuss. It was a drug culture of time, and King was mar marching, and there was sort of that craziness of the 60s. But I was the first Baptist church kid. In fact, I have a seven-year Sunday school attendance pen to prove it. So that's how... Baptist I was, am. Uh, I love church, went, got to, you know, came to faith, discipled uh, at some level there. And um, part of my story, though, is that um, I remember in 1967, I was a junior in high school, the rumor began to spread that the Blacks were coming to our white church. And uh, we lived in two separate worlds. We went to different schools, different water fountains, different movie theaters, different little leagues. And that was our world. And uh, we never even thought about it other than the way we lived in our structured culture and uh, so we asked the deacons that morning because we were a little bit afraid of that and said well what's going to happen if they come we'll be we'll be okay and he said not to worry they're not going to let them in well when I come back to my past I'm embarrassed for us the church I uh, believe we should have been on the front end of civil rights we should have been the one marching with King not to uh, worrying about what he was doing. And we're always, it seems like to me in my early church life, we were always behind. The church was always catching up. Not that you should adopt all the cultural norms, but that on the things that mattered, we just weren't innovative and creative and, and pioneering. And so uh, I didn't have the courage to ask those questions out loud, but because I lived in the hippie culture, we did ask questions a little more than maybe they do sometimes. And came on to Baylor in 68, uh, I was a religion major. Uh, my sophomore year, I became a youth director in a local Baptist church here. Uh, Waco was a little different, had a lot more poverty, uh, double the poverty most cities have. And uh, as my youth group began to grow, and I had a call one day from an African-American pastor named uh, Dewey Pinckney. He was head of the NAACP. He pastored a church called St. Mary's Baptist Church. I didn't know you could have a St. Mary's Baptist Church. Uh, there's nothing in my past that made that okay. And uh, I, I remember he said, would you meet me over here in no man's land? There was this little pocket of poverty between Waco and the adjoining small town called Bell Mead that nobody would take. It was so poor, so uh, behind, no infrastructure. There was no running water, no anything. Uh, all African-Americans, all dirt poor, houses falling down. We walked around the neighborhood that day. And, and I, again, I was a little nervous. It's my first time to dive deeper into the African-American culture and and um, there was one house had was kind of leaning to the right, tree growing through the front porch. And I said, uh, you mind if I look in? He said, no. And so I pushed the door open and a man screamed who was living in there. Uh, rats and roaches ran everywhere. Uh, the smell of poverty was absolutely overwhelming. 
and a man screamed because he did live there, but he couldn't see us because he was completely blind. And I thought, how can it be in the United States uh, that kind of poverty could exist? And so it was the beginning of the transforming work of the spirit uh, to begin to make me awaken and begin to see things through different eyes. Pinckney uh, invited us back and forth over the years. Uh, youth directed six years um, during and after Bader. At the end of my um, youth, youth directing time, I was invited to come out to become the recreation supervisor of a state home here in Waco. It was uh, 350 kids ages six to 17 taken away from their parents because of dependency and neglect. Uh, parents had abused them in some kind of way. They all lived in this old state home that was institutionalized. They were changing the institutional mindset and asked me to come out and be on that team. So I was looking for the gym the first day, stopped to talk to a house parent who was uh, talking to a six-year-old kid. And I remember walking up to them and this kid named Moki, six-year-old Moki cussed me out. And I thought, what in the world is going on out here? And I, um, Finally went on to the gym, found it, and uh, kind of understood that I was in for a little bit more than I thought I was. And kids began to play basketball. It didn't take but about 20 minutes. Two guys got into a fight. They were larger than me, and uh, they picked up chairs, hitting each other against the head, and blood was flowing. And it was, it was the worst day of the worst week of my life. Uh, I thought, what in the world am I doing out here? End of the week, I uh, went out to the big, we have a beautiful in city park called Cameron Park. And, I had to have a talk with God and remind him how important I was with my Sunday school pen and my youth directing years. And somehow he didn't get as impressed in me as I thought he should. And uh, that night as I shut up talking and listening to the spirit of God, just understood uh, I have been blessed. I've been parents who love me, a church that discipled me and brought me to faith and all the blessings of life. Go to, got to go to school and had friends. And here I was in this middle of this very painful culture of the kids. And uh, it was as if I heard God say that night, you know, go back and love those kids. I stayed three years. It was probably the best three years of my life in terms of discipleship, not your traditional way, but I had to learn to love kids who couldn't love me back, you know, all the abuse. And I was just another adult in their life. And so uh, as I uh, learned to love them and hang out with them on the basketball court, um, I was the lifeguard of the pool and they put 12 kids on a camp on a van and tell me to take them to big Ben and go camping. And so, you know, it was worst two days of my life on the first two front end of it. And then the back end was pretty good. And, but it was three years of falling in love with broken kids. And I, I really learned how to, for the first time to get past my Pharisee background to see not the brokenness of the outside and the words, but to love them as a broken kids and, and so desperately in need of love. Had I not done gone through those two experiences, I don't think I'd be doing what I am today. That was the kind of the thread of God's work with me. Went on to seminary. Uh, I had, went to Southwestern. It's about an hour and a half from here. And so Janet and I were dating. At, she was at Baylor still. And um, I worked inner city uh, while I was I'd go to school in the morning, work inner city in the afternoon down the housing projects. And so again, another dose of you know, domestic violence, drugs, guns, all that stuff, a world I never knew. But I was struggling again. Here I am talking all this big theology stuff in the morning and the afternoon down in the middle of the projects where nobody was. The church wasn't really there. And, and uh, so uh, finished up school. Jenny and I got married. Uh, and Dr. Ralph Neighbor called me. I don't know if any of you know Ralph. Ralph is a, a kind of a renegade Baptist back in the 70s who uh, was committed to cell groups way before it was a popular thing. And uh, they were doing some outside the box stuff in cell groups in West Houston, asked me to come be on his team, went to Houston and stayed three and a half years with him. We studied the cell group church in Korea, went over and spent some time with Young Cho's church and uh, how cell based church was so different from anything I understood. But we basically implemented it. I worked mostly with a uh, high school college and uh, young adults and it worked. I mean, we ended up uh, not only starting cell groups, but saw them multiply. I baptized over 100 high school kids that year. Um, and it was, it, was, I, I, it was a critical time in my life. I so desperately needed to see the church outside the traditional box. And uh, Ralph was the great guy for that, pushing against mainstream Baptist. And uh, so it was a very powerful season of our lives. But uh, I was on the west side of town where it was mostly wealthy kids. And I really knew that uh, we'd been called the poor. So Janet and I uh, decided we'd do the big, big risk and deciding where we called overseas to be a missionary. And uh, 
we sold our house and put our one-year-old child on our back and took off and ran out, went around the world for the next four and a half months, hung out and worked with the people in poverty, worked at, uh, all over Eastern Bloc as well, and then ended up in Calcutta, uh, went to the place where Mother Teresa was and got to meet her, got to spend time with her. She invited us into her house and we uh, had some really fun time just listening to her. And then we worked in what's called Kaligat, the, the home for the dying there and uh, worked in the slums, got to work in leper slums. So four and a half months of seeing poverty, seeing children that died in the mother's arms, all that was just overwhelming. And the brokenness that we brought back to uh, our return to the States, we decided to come back to Waco because we knew it, but we couldn't go back to middle-class America. It's like, how do you go ignore the fact that uh, 21,000 kids were gonna die daily from hunger related causes. And many of them didn't know, even know the name of Jesus. And so there was a deep, call to, to, to go be live among the poor. And so Waco as an old city uh, had an area of the city like most cities do where it used to be white middle class when the blacks began to move across the river into the old neighborhood, the white flight happened. And uh, so we found a house in the middle of that. The, it was a, it's a big old house. I live in a 4,000 square foot house that we bought for $12,000. Uh, crack cocaine on the corners, prostitutes everywhere, a bar across the street. Uh, the house that we bought had uh, been owned by a landlord or slumlord, really, who had two mentally ill guys on one side upstairs, a kid that had the rats and roaches everywhere. And this one lady had 40 cats in the one bedroom apartment downstairs. And we were so excited about our house. My father-in-law did not share the excitement that uh, we, we had. And he was already mad at me from the trip around the world with the grandchild. And now, um, so, but it, they were Christians. They were Bible church people in Oklahoma. And uh, it took a while to kind of, men some of those you know feelings because we had kind of moved away from mainstream and uh, we had no intentions of starting anything we just moved in to become friends in the neighborhood we bought into the relationship-based approach to just loving people I was still a grant writer and program director for a social service agency for eight years and then finally got some funds and um, I, I, we built a basketball court at my house we had an extra lot and so we built a quarter of a court, then multiplied it out to a half court, and then eventually a full court. So still right outside my door where we are, uh, there's a full court every day. There'll be 20 kids out there playing. And basically Mission Waco grew up playing basketball uh, with those kids. My children, we have four kids, um, played basketball. The prejudice I grew up with, uh, they didn't have. They played with more African-Americans and Hispanic kids than white. Uh, their friends couldn't, when they got in school, couldn't even come over to our part of the neighborhood. But, but um, my kids got it. They, they didn't reject um, who we were. And um, today I have one of them just left for Kenya a while ago, but he works uh, in Galveston doing the same thing we do here. He, uh, and then we have a, an adopted daughter from the neighborhood, a little Hispanic girl that was living in the back of a van at age three. And so, but we just dived into relationships. And uh, our model was, uh, the people with the problem need to be a part of the solution to the problem, not fix them. And so we went to CCDA. Some of you, do you all know CCDA? Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and explain it? it. Yeah. Uh, so, we in Mission Alive know, but not, maybe everybody may not. Okay. So Christian Community Development Association had been, they just been around three or four years. And somebody said, I think there's some folks that think like you. And so that should scare everybody. And so we found them in Denver that year for their conference. And it was like we found our best friends. They thought the way we did, they incarnational, they, um, their school kids went to inner city schools and they were fun. And so there was this deep bonding and we continued to stay a part of that movement for many years. I got on the board, the national board with them and, and um, we'd learn from each other, what Bob Lutfin was doing in Atlanta, uh, what Mary Nelson was doing in North Chicago. It, it was just this great connection. Um, after many years, just to fast forward, we just realized Texans weren't showing up at CCDA. They, because of our divided theology of separating social action and evangelism, uh, we um, uh, discovered they just couldn't handle anything to do with job training and alcohol and drug rehab, all those things we were doing, because for them that was more liberal. And of course it wasn't, but that's the way they thought. And I was one of them and I, and I had compassion on them, but it was just different. So we basically have lived in the same house for 43 years. The neighborhood was a mess. Uh, today, if I could take you down the street uh, and, and talk about what God's done, we now have Mission Waco grew up that way. We didn't have a master plan. We just did the next thing. So when the mama would say, my husband needs a job, we'd start a job training program. Or women, the women's group with Janet would say, my uncle's on 
crack. And so we started alcohol and drug rehab program. We didn't know what we were doing each time. It was, we, there was, that was before Google. And, um, but we just figured out, you know, we can figure this stuff out. And we did. And, and so by the grace of God, um, now here we are, Mission Waco's 20, almost 29 years old. We have 80 staff and 16 programs and uh, the neighborhood is so blended so fun black white brown rich poor uh, we have um, the corner where we do a lot of our work we bought an old well we actually didn't buy it there was a shopping center that had become a porno theater and three bars uh, down the street and it we went down and the city boarded it up we got uh, uh, the owners to, we made him an offer he said will you give us a deal and he said no here and he signed the deed and handed it to us so we had five buildings sitting in the water and we have a little saying here, there's a real fine line between faith and stupid and you're never quite sure which side of the line you're on. And, and so we, we started working on those uh, issues and everything grew up, children's program, teen programs. Um, uh, we have alcohol and drug rehab. We've got a 56 bed shelter, got a clinic, uh, got um, um, a pretty significant, um, um, well, we've redone 16 buildings. Let me put it that way, economic development. Uh, and over the last couple of years before I, I finished up as retirement, um, two of my real fun things where we did a kind of the ending of lots of these things, seeing the neighborhood come back together was a grocery store, a nonprofit grocery store called Jubilee Food Market. Mm -hmm. And uh, because those are so hard, USDA says it's the most uh, important part of the hunger issue that we're not really facing in America. And we had a grocery store across the street that had gone belly up. 20 years before and had become a, a predatory convenience store and the neighborhood people kept saying please help us find a place instead of walking two miles to get healthy and affordable food and so by the grace of God we eventually waited them out bought them out um, brought Christian guys together that knew the grocery store business and and we basically um, created the grocery, grocery store four years ago and then the last piece was we uh, did um, the bar across the street called Martha Jane's was a really, really rough. And we finally got it and made it into an economic center to bring uh, economic development back into the neighborhood. So we've got a Hispanic guy that runs this incredible ice cream place called uh, uh, Aztecas de Gelado. And then we've got a, other couple businesses there. So, um, so now I just get to hang and, and do things and go to the next level. So we invested pretty deeply in this CCDA lookalike for Texas called the Texas Christian Community Development Network. So we founded that, began to get friends together across eight regions of Texas and uh, started doing conferences uh, and bringing in people to help the church understand this difference of holistic ministry. What does it look like? And uh, so each year for the last 10 years, we've had a conference somewhere in Texas. And uh, we this year will be in Houston. We expect 800 people to be there. We'll have outside outstanding speakers and 60 or 70 workshops. So most of what I'm doing now is teaching Christian community development classes. I do a, a two day, 10 hour class um, in churches and places around Texas and a little bit in Louisiana and to, in, uh, Oklahoma. And then I still teach at the seminary, teach at the Christian community development classes there. And uh, so it's kind of this real fun part of, I'm 71 years old now and still love life and um, healthy by the grace of God. So we're we're watching, uh, look, quick aside, I know this is about church. Let me I apologize for talking so much. Um, the first year we were there, uh, starting Mission Waco, Janet and I had breakfast one Sunday morning at uh, Taco Cabana near the interstate. Looked over and there were the homeless people sleeping under the bridge. Uh, I-35 comes through Waco. And so uh, we said, you know what? We don't understand homelessness. Let's just go invite them over here. We'll buy breakfast and have them be our teachers. And so five guys showed up and we sat on the outside of the restaurant there and asked them stories, questions about their stories. They told us their lives. And, you know, by the, any other account, if I'd have grown up like most of them, I would have also been under a bridge. But we really had a great morning and they said, hey, let's do it next week. So the next Friday we met again. They brought more friends. Third week, breakfast cost $250 and that <laughs> can't keep doing this. But uh, every time was we learned so much more. And then they said to us, come across the street under the bridge and um, lead a Bible study next week. And Janet sings and plays the guitar. So we went over and about six guys showed up. And we had a Bible study and they said, this is fun. Let's do it next week. And then two, second week became um, just like the first. And it kept growing a little bit. And so, so each week we kept meeting 
And uh, over time, uh, it grew into a church. They called it Church Under the Bridge. And uh, we separated Mission Waco from the church. We didn't want a board of directors to oversee a church. And um, we didn't have any rules. We didn't have any denominational ties. We just, uh, all that creativity that, that, that I wanted the church to be, now it was put up or shut up time. You know, it's easy to blame the church, but now there was no rules to follow. And so we had to figure out how do you help become a very uh, inclusive church for the prostitute and the drug dealer? And um, how do you help the people feel like it's their church, not go preach to them on Sunday morning like a lot of middle-class churches do to the poor people? We just, how do you help grow it up? So we stayed true to our principles uh, and uh, learned a whole lot about what to do and what not to do. And so my real joy uh, now is uh, after be 29 years in September, Church of the Bridge is now a church about a we were running 275 under the bridge when the COVID thing hit. We're down to about 150 right now. Um, we're, we're every week's growing again. It's gotten back pretty big. About a year and a half ago, the Department of Transportation called and said, hey, we're going to tear down the bridge where y'all meet. We're redoing I-35, and it's going to affect you. They didn't care that we were there. And um, so we uh, knew we had to move. Article in the newspaper said, uh, front page said, homeless church is about to be homeless. And uh, the, we had a call from Chip and Joanna. Chip called and said, hey, uh, we're closed on Sundays. We know you guys. Come on over here and do church on, at, at Magnolia. So for the last year and a half, we've been in the courtyard of the okay. silos. Uh, ironically, Waco, which was always poor, now has 35,000 people a week coming to Waco to see their stuff. And it's put an economic engine in Waco that has never been there, which has been a real joy at some level. Our bigger problem now is the other side of the problem is going to be gentrification and things like that, where mm -hmm. uh, we, a lot of poor areas could be bought out or being bought out a little bit in some places because the houses are so cheap compared to other cities. So uh, anyway, we're fully engaged and we do missions. We give half of the money that comes in to, away to missions. We, uh, we take the homeless with us on mission trips. We don't just go serve the homeless. We take them with us. They're a lot, they know a lot more than the Vader kids. The Vader kids are extremely smart, smart and know how to play with the uh, urban kids, but they can't use a rip saw or anything like that. So we all go together and, and serve together. And, and it's incredible bonding of what happens when you got uh, a mix of people serving together. And so uh, we do that with a lot of creative stuff. We do recovery Sunday. We do, um, you know, go to the streets. I mean, go, go into the community a couple times a year. We um, have this Sunday, uh, I wish you could be with us. It's Palm Sunday. Most of you will in, you know, enjoy that. But we, <laughs> the second year we were there, we decided, okay, Palm Sunday needs to be livened up a little bit. So we got a donkey, put one of the homeless guys on the donkey, uh, gave everybody palm branches. We washed each other's feet. And then we um, uh, made a line with our palm branches and the donkey came through and it was so fun, so meaningful. So then the next uh, year we did it and it was the same way. And third year though, the donkey came across the street and got into the, where the palm branches were waving and he freaked out, wouldn't move. So everybody became a donkey expert, you know, blowing his ear, pull his tail, nothing to worry. That donkey wasn't going anywhere. But we have some bikers that show up. So we took Jesus off the donkey and put him on the hog and uh, they came roaring through the line. And uh, so we, we do that each year now. And, uh, and so we'll, this Sunday, we'll wash feet. We'll have communion in small groups. We'll uh, go out into the courtyard and have the donkey with one of the Jesus figures. We've had black, we've had black, white, and brown Jesuses. So we get to share a little bit of culture there. And, and so that kind of stuff, Easter, we go out to a camp, we baptize in a river. We'll be there the following week. So uh, it's just a place where people are real. They're coming straight out of jail. Uh, or they're coming really from rich churches where they just got tired of sitting in Sunday school classes. So it's a real broad base of differences. So, and I'm going to shut up now because I've talked too much. Well, I'm going to ask you to talk some more for just a second, but I want to, I want to kind of go a slightly different direction for just a second. I think it's a, it's safe to assume that in the last 43 years of doing this, uh, that you've experienced some personal transformation. Would you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Um, God beat the Pharisee out of me. Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, you know, I, I'm still, I was a rule follower and I, I'm, I'm, you know, still, I don't despise my ethical background because the church really helped shape that. But uh, to come to a place of brokenness with the stay-at-home kids, with the poor, where I'm no better than anybody. And, and that humility um, 
changed the way I do life. It, it's, it's like we're, I'm not trying to impress anybody. Don't, I don't let them call me reverend. I, I refuse to get caught in the roles of being the preacher boy. And so uh, it, it is the, I've I written four books. One of my, my favorite book was called Trolls and Truth. We call ourselves trolls under the bridge because we're sleeping under bridges or they did. And um, I wrote, the book was called uh, Trolls and Truth, uh, 14 Things uh, That the Church Doesn't Want to Face, 14 Realities. And what it's about is what I've learned from the poor about the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus talked about the, with the widow who gave her last two mites, the, the Pharisee who beat his, you know, thought he was so much better versus the guy who's beating his chest. So using the stories of our people and the, the brokenness of their lives, but what I learned about God from them is, is kind of how I look at things, which is completely backward from the PhD academic training that I came from. Um, so it's really, um, and it's still the position we work out of. And so we, it's, it's just validity. And that way, you know, I can, I can be, I can, I mean, it's not who I, I mean, I still am a goody two shoes enough. I had a, had a huge African-American guy come up to me after a sermon one time on racial reconciliation, and he was using the most filthy language. And I thought, this man's going to beat me up for something I said. What he was doing was complimenting the sermon. He just used different words than I use when I compliment. Uh, and so you just kind of loosen up and realize uh, that, that, you know, we're in different places in our background, but we love each other. And so there's a lot of affirmation, a lot of small groups and a lot of dealing with pain in our people's lives. But it is that brokenness that was the main thing that's changed me. Hey, Roy, why don't you jump in here? Yeah, thank you. Um, so so I live about 30 minutes south of Waco in a place called Temple. And um, I, I've known of Jimmy uh, for a little while. I think uh, we bumped into each other at the CCD and National Conference. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about um, uh, Mission Waco and, and the reason I you know, was told Todd, hey, we, ha we have to get this guy is um, the way that uh, your the ministry there is is helping to is, it helps me kind of expand my imagination about what the kingdom is about and how that can be expressed in different ways. Um, but one of the things that you do at Mission Waco, and I want to ask you uh, talk about that a little bit, is the uh, poverty simulation that yeah. program. Could you talk about what that's about, why you do it, and how that's connected to the development of disciples and leaders for the church? Yeah. About uh, 30 years ago, we were not officially Mission Waco. A youth director in Oklahoma City called and said he's a Bible church guy. And so these kids were sharp. They knew their Bible, but they were still very prejudiced against uh, people who didn't look like them. And he said, uh, we just got back from an India trip. And we, by the way, we, Mission Waco is Mission Waco, Mission World. So we work in Haiti, Mexico City, and India as well, unreached people groups and uh, do the same Christian community development model. We just gotten back from a trip. He called and said, uh, can you do something to help us kind of shake these kids up from their duplicity? They think one way, but they, I mean, they know the Bible one way, but they do differently. So we created a poverty simulation. It was just a, we didn't even have a building. We had it at our house. 26 kids came and it went remarkably well it rained all weekend just one of those crazy experiences but it was so powerful for his youth group that he wrote an article to a group magazine which was the youth correct youth group uh, magazine and um, talked about it and then another youth director called and so they brought kids and then we it just kept multiplying we never intended on it being a big deal well all these years later we now do it 12 times a year we had to start taking control of the schedule because we had so many different requests and we've been doing it uh, these 30 years. We've had 25,000 people go through the weekend. They've come from all over America. They've become poor on Friday night at 8 o'clock till Sunday afternoon at 2.30. Uh, we don't tell the details. And a couple, a couple things, uh, Roy, that I think most people can appreciate. I know you can do planned famine. I, we appreciate all those kind of things. It's educational. But you go to eat McDonald's after you go home that night. So the extended experiential education. I was, Janet and I were ropes course instructors. Um, I uh, came to believe that we, we teach Sunday school classes with this cognitive mindset that I'm gonna, we call it cognitive dumping. I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of information that's gonna change your life. But in reality, it doesn't. And the behavioral studies show that a lot of times that, that 
the sermon doesn't really hit the, the change factor as much as we think it should and, and does. And so um, when I have a, when I'm teaching, doing a ropes course and I have this rope that's got all these tinsels in it that'll really strong, I can do that lecture to them in a classroom but when I'm holding them on the top of a pamper pole to jump off on a trapeze, the lesson looks a lot different. So we adapt a lot of the teaching we do into more experiential models. And so the poverty simulation was the ideal. It's 42 hours. Uh, we charge $79 to be poor. What a deal for everybody. Uh, and so they, it's not just for teens. It, you have to be out of the eighth grade, but we have uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of people that come all ages, some people bringing folks down to do it for their mission trip to train before they go to their mission trip or whatever it is. But the poverty simulation has been the wake up call for so many uh, people, uh, a lot of Baylor kids as well, that um, it, it just it's kind of that breaking weekend where you start understanding poverty from an experiential side instead of just the, the information about how many kids are hungry today. And uh, that's kind of a model we do with a lot of things, but that's the most intense one we do. And, uh, and so COVID is, you know, obviously we've had a, we shut it down for the, that time. We had our last, last weekend, we had our first group, uh, all the Catholic rocker. I'm a kid from the Catholic school come every year and Christians, we, I mean, we literally, it's the most incredible, but, but we've had them from North Carolina and California. They, they come for that reason. And um, it is a powerful weekend. Could you, um, so I have, uh, I'm going to ask uh, two more questions um, and then I want to turn it over to it any of the questions that anybody else has. So please do just put those questions in the chat. Um, can you, so there are some of us who have a little bit of familiarity with uh, the phrase Christian community development. Your latest book is Commonwealth Transformation Through Christian Community Development. Can, can you just elaborate a little bit about what Christian community development is and how that differs from maybe other approaches to engaging with uh, poverty? Uh, it's not rocket science. It's um, the, the, the three R's that, are, you know, CCDA always used with John was relocation, redistribution, and uh, um, what was one I forget? Look at redistribution. Uh, well, I'll think of it in a second. Uh, and, and I think reconciliation. The, the, yeah, thank you. Um, the first one is just where you are. I mean, when you live in a, in a poor neighborhood, it changes the way you look at the world. And so because the middle class and a lot of times middle class white culture moved away from the poverty um, and they still have good hearts at some level, they just don't know what to do. So what's happened in the American church, unfortunately, has been the relief, fix it, fix people, give, give stuff away mindset. And so we're very opposed to that model. And, um, and so, you know, people feel guilty around Thanksgiving or Christmas and they come over and buy blankets and do stuff with good hearts, good intentions, but they actually become part of the problem. CCDA operates from the fact that, that uh, the people with a problem need to be a part of the solution. And so, so we ended to say with the grocery store, we had uh, 65 people in the neighborhood that we made that decision together to do a grocery store. Um, we learned from Bob Lufton in Atlanta how he did his toy store at Christmas. And if y'all are not familiar with that model, it's basically instead of uh, taking, we have taken the toys over to the poor neighborhood and taking their picture on the front porch and taking their dignity away, we would say, no, um, uh, we do this huge biker toy run, have 20 churches that give us new unwrapped toys. Uh, we put them in our children's center, make a toy store for several weeks. And then the, the neighborhood and community people who are in living in poverty, we have a meeting, just kind of a resource meeting, not, a, not to tell them uh, it's, it's very, very powerful. Here's what we can do to help you when you need help, but we'll, we'll uh, work together on this. Then they get to come by for their own kids. And that $10 toy that some child donated becomes a $2 toy. So uh, either uh, $10, $10, I mean, 10% or 20% based on the year. And then it, the dignity of that, it, and of course it took the churches a long time to get this. That's just not the way they thought. And they thought, why are you, I'm giving you toys and you're selling it to the poor? Yes, because of dignity. So ultimately there's a, uh, it, if I'm in the back of the room and somebody in the neighborhood is leading the meeting, then it's successful. If the people, 
any leadership skills. They, they don't have the same set of skills. It's so easy to take over. It's so easy to give stuff away, but it undermines the very thing we're trying to do, empowerment. So CZA is an empowerment model ministry that um, the, my joy today is that the children that played on my basketball court when they were five years old are now 45 years old, and many of them work for us, and they uh, have kept their jobs. They've done, we do job training. We do all those things. So, and, and all of them have not made it, but a lot of them have. So at the end of the, at the day, it's a long process because since we're a highly mobile society, uh, most people don't stick around very long in the neighborhoods. And we didn't plan on it. That wasn't our intention when we started. It's just that building these deeper relationships kept um, being more important than the next you know, move up the church ladder. And so we never left. And by the grace of God, we, we've got friends. They uh, had, a, had a guy last week uh, came and said, um, uh, he said, is it okay my grandkid plays basketball in your court? And I said, well, of course, everybody's open to play there. And he said, well, my name is so-and-so, do you remember me? And he said, no, he says, he said, I used to play on your basketball court. I'm now 56 years old. <laughs> so I thought, it's not going to be long. When, the, when the, my youth group is now 60, first youth group is now 69 years old, you don't have long when the youth director, but, but it's like, that's the joy of this stuff is just hanging around uh, in neighborhood a long time. And it's community-based. And I have come to believe that um, David Brooks, if you know him on PBS and all the rest, he became a Christian a couple of years ago, really powerful story. They showed up at Church on the Bridge one day. But the, the reality is um, he would say, you know, we're trying to change the world through these, all this political stuff and policy. Ultimately, it's neighborhood ministries that have some of the most high impact on change. And we have seen that and the, the people who again it's 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 painful sometimes when they don't make it or somebody relapses but uh to see change from that b base level and it raises the bar ccda raises the bar of what you're doing in neighborhoods is just as important as the big revival and having the big deal that we do so uh, be comfortable with not having a big deal thank you for for kind of fleshing that out um so you know, when we invite guests on who just published a book, like, you know, one of the reasons I think Jimmy agreed to do this was because I, I was going to tell you to go buy his book. Um, so Commonwealth uh, Transformation Through Christian Community Development. Um, one of the things I, I really appreciate about it is the way that, you know, you kind of tell the story um, of, you know, your story, but of the development of what is now a very large um, organization one uh one detail that i i think is important um especially for us who are in um urban ministry or or kind of in that cross between neighborhood church and neighborhood um uh, service organization uh charity navigator um recognized M mission waco as being a, a four-star charity so that's like their highest rating um as as far as you know how you use money and, and all of that one of my, my question is you started by moving into a neighborhood and you talk about the just the importance of developing relationships with your neighbors beginning to um listen to stories work on projects together and now you uh you just stepped out of leadership in a very large organization. So as that has grown from being highly relational to being, you know, a lot of organization, a lot of money moving around, a lot of staff, um, how has how has your life changed yeah. in that process? Good question. Through the Mission Waco years, um, I, I, we never quit being relational. Um, as more time happened to fundraise and uh, do leadership development for our staff and those kind of things. Clearly, 100% of my time was no longer there for that. Uh, but but we built programs that re the, the staff understood relational stuff. And so they have continued to, to do that with their, and we, we still work hard and we still play together and did a lot of things together. Um, I appreciate you noting the four-star rating. It wasn't because we need an accolade. What matters for us was our, our commitment to ethics, that we made a decision back there, no matter what it cost us, we would do outside audits, we would keep our nose clean, uh, we would uh, be able to, we had to learn, and I was a grant writer for a while, so learning how to uh, have benchmarks to 
share, you know, it's easy to come out and say, hey, I, we helped a bunch of kids get, get their education. Well, what does that mean? So we can show from the time they came in at the school year till the end of that school year, this is how much changed in their reading and math uh, or whatever it is. We, we have um, behavioral um, marks of, so more and more of my time got into how do we maintain this growing structure that's got uh, some kind of a um, impact of change that we can see. Uh, there's obviously some things you can't do as well, but it is, um, it, it's still maintained. And by the way, just in leadership change, um, that's a hard thing. I mean, my fingers were all over this stuff and 28 years, what do you do next? And who wants to get paid a low salary and get that much, do that much work? But we um, started three years before. Uh, I knew I'd, in the years ahead that I would um, have to step down. And I brought a guy in three years ago and we made sure he was the right guy and put him in different leadership skill sets. And then next, and then the last year I moved to the side on staff and he became the executive director. And so this seamlessness of leadership development is not something a lot of us know how to do. Churches don't do it very well, nonprofits as well. So sometimes it just falls apart. So my joy today is that I have been able to pull to the back and enter when I want to. And John Calloway is our director and does a great job of that. So it, it, it is a relationship thing still, but um, mine now is kind of a secondhand uh, deal when I go, you know, go out on basketball court and hang out with kids that uh, remember back in the early days. So it's not quite the same, but it, it is, uh, if you, my favorite part of the whole book is the dedication. I don't know if you read the pages, the front page, uh, it's easy to skip over. There's two whole pages of neighborhood people that we dedicated the book to. And that's my, that's my favorite part of the book. Cause we, Janet and I'd walk the neighborhood still and remember, oh yeah, you remember when Junior Craig was drunk on our porch every day for the last tw you know, two years or uh, the good and the bad, but it is, it's still who we are because of the neighborhood, but it is different. Thank you. Um, so I want to just turn it over. Uh, Kevin has a question. Kevin, why don't you uh, jump in? Thanks, uh, Jimmy, for what all you've shared. I had, uh, so we have been working in Canada in an inner city context for over 10 years with kids. And as the kids got older, we started youth group and high school group and so on. But more recently, we found uh, you know, not, a number of them became Christians and some of them became leaders, but we have not retained any of those kids into basically past high school. So more recently, it's like, well, what, uh Oh, you know, uh -oh. what are, different Sorry. questions? Like, what are we doing wrong or what could we do different or what are we missing? Yeah. Like, the keys you found in terms of helping those kids yeah. be, become lifelong disciples. Yeah, I will say this. Um, we didn't always keep them in the church. They, they weren't really, Church of the Bridge was, um, our early thought was that we would, you know, they'd come to Christ through their early years. And then, then eventually, uh, especially those that were African American or Hispanic, they'd end up, we, our, our thought was they'd end up going to those ethnic cultural church, churches. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, what really happened is the, the parachurch organization stayed with them so some of the the best work we've done in terms of our christian faith our our children's program is a good example the girl who came uh we've had lots of children's directors through the years a lot of more beta kids and they stay two or three years on the way to real their other world but this woman's been with us 13 years uh the christian growth has happened mostly through still through our children and youth programs it's like a youth group for a church but it's not a church uh, so the parachurch structure still works better for us in discipleship. Wasn't our intention? Uh, Church of the Bridge was really kind of the far off people, but we have kids now that we've had since they were children that are strong in their faith, and some of them go to other churches. But uh, the, as you know, that the church structure is not very amenable to a lot of kids feeling like this is what I want to do on Sunday morning or whatever the time it is. So it's kind of a uh, a, it's a hybrid of sorts, if anything. I'm not sure I wish it was that way because we really, we have, we have a youth group at Church in the Bridge. We work real hard. The, our youth group is not your normal group that I used to work with. These are kids that are pretty broken. And so it, it even looks a lot different. But uh, in our youth group at Mission Waco, 
our goal is to get them out of the neighborhood. We, we've, we've come to Washington, D.C. We've gone to Boston. We've taken them to, on trips way outside the neighborhood. We've, taught, we've got a scholarship program so they'll go to college and we can help them go to college and stay with them where they're going. So our world has expanded their world uh, and it's always had a Christian piece to it, but it's not quite the same as doing it through the institutional church. Kevin, follow-up question? Yeah, so, yeah, like, I, I'm not, um, you know, my, my hope and expectation isn't that they stay in our church, but that we, like, we started off as a children's ministry and then became a youth ministry or added that piece, and so I, I would be totally happy if they were disciples yeah. in another church or yeah. in any context, but really none of them have kept with it, yeah. and so that's the part that, that worries me. Can yeah. you can you stay with them? I mean, in, in, in words, um, I know they get older, but it is. I think that's that continuity that we've experienced when we the same girl who wiped their nose in their when they were five is now and when they're eighteen is still uh, loving them and leading them and knows mama and you know it's like it is that pastoral relationship which I know it's not quite the same, but their faith is. I mean, we we hold the bar high for ethics and encourage them and they you know again we we lose some and some disappoint but that's just part of the ministry so uh, but it is worth the thing that's been nice for mission waco is uh, over time is the longevity we've got people that have been here 20 years 18 years that didn't start off that way so a lot of these nonprofits that mean well they lose people and turnover is so quick but when you've got the continuity it really does help even in their faith faith growth it's a good question. It's a hard question. And, and we're losing, I don't know, you know, the data, but in, you take Canada, United States, and, and uh, uh, Europe, every week, uh, 53,000, thousand leave the church and don't come back. So this is a, a Western culture problem. It's, and to hang on to them uh, is, is so hard uh, in a postmodern culture that we are still trying to do things sometimes in a out, very outdated way. And, um, you know, they're, they're, the gospel is the gospel, but there's a lot of them that just, they're walking, they're, they believe in God, but they don't walk the faith and not growing in discipleship. Thanks. So Jimmy, um, it, we're a church planting organization and we, we continually have church planters and we particularly focus on marginalized communities. What would you say to uh, church planters that are about to move into a location about, when they first get there, what, what would be the first few things you would want to see them do? Uh, I think first thing is to get the, the, the sending group to relax and not put a whole bunch of expectations on them. What happens is, you know, we're going to raise this money, we're going to send you over to that part of town, and we expect to see something by the end of the year. That's just not fair. It, relationships, are rela they take time. And so it, I think there's an unfair uh, expectation that that I've got to report to the higher authority that's sending me over here. It's relationships and it always will be about that. And by the grace of God, it's going to, it's going to take some turns that we didn't expect it to. Uh, and that's okay. You know, I mean, I think the church should be creative and do things a little differently than we've done them. So I, I really, it, again, it, the whole thing is relationships. So at the end of the day, uh, that, having that um, recovering alcoholic be a part of the leadership team is critical early on. Uh, you need to find leaders who are uh, able to, we have a girl who was on our streets for 13 years as a prostitute. She's one of our main leaders uh, at Church on the Ridge. And, you know, we, we struggle. Those were at the question. Nobody ever asked, can a prostitute read the scripture in church? Well, yeah, I think so. You know, why wouldn't they? And, but those were questions nobody ever talked about. So we really were in the dark in a lot of our decision-making and what do you do with somebody who uh, fails again? You know, those are, it's not that all of us sin and do that, but we can privately do it without all the exposure. When something happens, uh, they go to county jail for the fourth time, you know, do you let them come back and lead again? Yeah, you know, we do. So it, it is a, a, a different set of expectations than I think the church sending team has. And it's very easy to get criticized. You know, you, you, you just, you try to defend your people, but I think this, the problem is a lot is just the expectations are we want to see something for our money, which is a very middle-class mindset. 
Anything else that you would say to leaders of established churches in terms of their own uh, change yeah. perspective? Uh, I, there was a time in my, of course, I grew up in the 60s. There was a time I, I got angry at the church. Um, it was, you know, I, I kept seeing the double standards of the way we live, the, the, the lack of compassion for people in need. Uh, at some point, 15, 20 years ago, I got sad for the church. Uh, they were missing the fun. We love what we get to do. I, I would have do the whole thing over again because, and it's like, you know, I didn't know that our kids wouldn't be beaten up or that something, I mean, it, it could happen. I mean, but by God's grace, that didn't happen. And a lot of the CCA people will say the same. Some have had some struggles, but it, generally it is the, the thing I, I want the church to know is they're missing the fun. And, and, and I, I'll say this, carefully uh there's a whole the whole bible study on the worst uh, sclerosis the hardening of heart in the bible um paul is so and james too there is a point where when you hear the same sunday school lesson over and over for 20 or 30 years and don't do anything with that it's a hardness of heart issue and so um the aliveness happens for so many of the pioneers who say i'm tired of sitting here i'm gonna go next sunday i'm gonna go do something differently I think we need to give our people, you know, what you've seen, there's no, no big deal in this. Pioneers are the early adopters. That's what you, uh, I'm sorry, the pioneers out there first, the early adopters who come with them. Then you've got the late adopters who finally, after a couple of years, go play. And then there's the resistors. It doesn't matter what uh, you do. They're not getting out of that institutional mindset. So um, it's just a long haul. So each of you that are the pioneers, it's a lonely road for a while because uh, there's not a lot of people who get it who will be with you. And then finally, a few will come. So again, the consistency over time is a really important piece. Wow. Well, that's very, very powerful. Man, I, I, we could keep asking you questions all day long. Thank you so much for your time. I'm but retired. I, didn't, I got time. Uh, well, Roy's got one more question at least. <laughs> so uh, hang tough. Roy, what you got? Um, I, well, you just asked. Uh, I think you kind of you kind of asked it. Um, um, but one of the things, um, this is similar, but Jimmy, you in your free time um, are a professor of uh, ministry students. Um, what do you hope to open their mind to uh, as a professor? Yeah. Uh, I do at the seminary. I won't let them call me doctor. Uh, I'm Jimmy. I'm well, Jimmy to everybody. Um, there's such a cultural trap to be the religious guy, to be the doctor. So getting rid of titles is a big deal for me. Um, letting them see who I am, talk about personal life is, you know, to, to, to be vulnerable and be uh, able to, to model stuff. Uh, the way I teach the class, community development is a great way. So the best part about being able to teach in Waco is that they're not just hearing from me. We, we, I do a J term with a lot of, we had 31 last year, had two seminaries and um, all these other kids. And uh, it is a transformative week. It is the most powerful week, but we have the recovery guys come talk. We have the prostitute share her story. We let, let them dig into the, and it's, it's so transformative because it's close and, and there, it's not watching a video or YouTube. It's just, it's real people and who sometimes say things that you think, oh, we shouldn't say it that way. But, but it is uh, so the intensity of that one week is so powerful for us. Um, and then even classes, it's like, we, you got to get out of the classroom. You got to get you, you, the community engagement class I teach for Baylor. I teach a class on uh, environmental uh, creation care, creation and environmental care. We, Janet and I have degrees in, in uh, environmental stuff too. Uh, for our work among the poor, and you know, we go the we go the dump, we go the the, the recycling bin, we go to we Mission Waco has a, a program an urban REIT where we actually do aquaponics and we do composting in 24 hours and we have solar. Uh, that's part of the kingdom for us, and so they can't learn that in a classroom. You got to get them out of the classroom and do as much as you can away from the institutional stuff. And it's just a great teaching model. And it, you know, it's based on the institution. They give me a lot of freedom now, but it's, it's uh, not everybody will let you do those kind of things. Um. Roy, any uh, follow-up to that? 
yeah, like, uh, you know, days worth. And, and <laughs> you know, thankfully, unlike everybody else, I'm not far away. So, yeah. Yeah, but you got to get up here. We want to see you here, buddy. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see the question. We've been working with kids. Oh, yeah, that's the same. Well, Jimmy, uh, uh, Roy asked you about uh, the poverty simulation, and both of my children have been to the poverty simulation. They have. Are they still mad at me? I don't know if they're still, no, they came home utterly transformed. Uh, I think it was part of what drove my son to, to ministry. Um, so thank you for what you do. Um, you, uh, you certainly are an encouragement and we appreciate your time today. Let me say this quickly about the global piece because, um, and all of you've read when helping hurts, if not, you should, mm -hmm. um, we do globally like we do locally. So I work in Haiti. We have 350 women in a microcredit program. Uh, we have a Haitian staff that we raised up. We drill water wells and because of, we have Haitians. Everything we do, it's almost easier to do Christian community development models in poor countries than it is in the States because we want to fix it all and we're not really connected. But um, the uh, and there's a chapter in when helping hurts for, because people still love the short-term mission trips. We're not against it. We call them exposure trips because you're basically getting in somebody else's space to be, to learn to cry again and see things, but you have to work hard in the, the, if you're doing global ministries, community development is a great way to do it. And it just like everything else takes time. So read the chapter in when helping hurts, uh, we spent $1.6 billion last year on short-term mission trips, but they're really more about uh, getting in the way of the missionary and letting the, uh, but seeing the needs and, you know, when you realize that kid didn't eat today, it changes you. So we believe in some of those, but uh, our work in India is with an unreached people group. We don't take outsiders with us on that. We live, my wife stayed two months last year with a semi-nomadic buffalo herders in the, nor in the uh, edge of the Himal Himalayas. Um, and so uh, it's relational, everything we do. But I think it will affect, because there's so much about our missional mindset has just been institutionalized like the church has been. And we've got to loosen up and see, listen to the people, have meetings, let the neighborhood people, let the, the, the poor in the other nations be a part of the decision-making process or you'll never really get very far down the road. Wow, what a powerful way to end, thank you. Thank you for all you've done and for what you continue to do, uh, the teaching, the training, and sharing some time with us this afternoon. Blessings on you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. All right. God bless. Thanks, everybody.